Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Royal Army Museum in Brussels, part of the Belgian War Heritage Institute. We're here taking a look at some of the really cool and really unusual firearms in their reserve collection. And this is one that I've been wanting to show you guys for a long time. I've been wanting to get my hands on an intact one for a long time. This is a 303 caliber first pattern drawer automatic rifle or light machine gun. And this is a weapon that was developed, well, just the story behind this is fantastic. So, uh, sounds like a total loony conspiracy theory, but I assure you this is all completely true. So the backstory of this is uh, the uh, British Palestine becoming the nation of Israel. In 1948 Israel would fight a war of independence against uh, its new Arab neighbors, and the 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 Jewish Palestinians who would become Israelis, I'm just going to refer to them as Israelis for simplicity's sake through the rest of this video, uh, although Israel didn't technically exist when these events, most of these events were taking place. Um, the Israelis recognized that this opportunity to form a nation was coming, and they were going to need to have an armed force and weapons, and they were going to need to prepare for it. And uh, they began preparing you know, decades in advance in some ways, but this particularly ramped up with the end of World War II. Uh, the United States, among other countries, had an awful lot of war surplus when the Second World War ended. And so Israeli representatives of what would become IMI uh, were dispatched to the United States in the fall of 1945 to buy munitions fabrication equipment. Um, in particular there was a guy named Haim Slavin, my Hebrew is non-existent, hopefully I'm pronouncing that sort of close to correctly. Um, he would eventually, actually he became the manager of Tal, which became IMI, in 1937. His experience went back to like 1929 he set up a grenade factory, almost certainly not legally at that point. But 1945 he comes to the US to get munitions supplies. And there is a lot of there are a lot of industrial companies that are selling off production lines for things with the end of the war, and so Slavin, uh, as a delegate of basically IMI, is able to buy up things uh, covertly for basically the price of scrap metal. They pack them up as just machine parts and ship them off to Israel. Uh, among other things, he purchased uh, Remington's complete 303 British cartridge production line. They bought a line of a complete barrel making assembly line, uh, bought a production line for 81 millimeter mortar ammunition. This is the sort of stuff they were looking for. And while all of those things are well and good, there was a need for automatic weaponry. They needed machine guns. And so this plot was basically formed to build what was called the gun. And in these circles at this time, this was the gun gun. Uh, yeah, there was some production of Sten guns underground in Israel around this time period, but this was something that the, the establishment, what would become the Israeli establishment, really had a lot of hope and expectation invested in. And it was essentially a Johnson model of 1947 light machine gun. So if we switch gears here for a few minutes, uh, the Johnson company was set up um, the Johnson semi-automatic rifle was a late competitor to the M1 Garand. Uh, wasn't quite successful, but was really quite a good rifle. There were a bunch of Johnson rifles and Johnson machine guns that were actually sold to the Dutch for use in the Dutch East Indies. Those guns never managed to make it to the Dutch East Indies because the Japanese occupied them before they could be shipped out. Uh, the machine guns in particular ended up being basically requisitioned by the US Marines and were used by the Marines in the Pacific. Uh, so there was US military use of these machine guns. Johnson, um, after the war, continued to work on developing the machine gun design. Uh, there was a 1944 pattern, there was a 1945 pattern, and there was a 1947 prototype pattern. In particular the 47 introduced this double tube style of uh, buttstock that we see on the early drawers. Now nobody would buy, nobody ended up buying the 1947 pattern Johnson, and the company went out of business not too long thereafter. Um, nothing else ended up coming of the, the Johnsons except for drawers. Uh, where these two stories come together is, <laughs> and this is one of the crazy parts of the story, um, you may have heard of the Dardic. 
uh, the Dardic Tround, the really weird 1950s magazine-fed revolver with the triangular cartridges, invented by a guy named David Dardic. David Dardic was uh, a Russian Jew, ethnically, and he was next door neighbors to a guy named Karl Ekdahl. Karl Ekdahl was one of the founding partners of Johnson Automatics. Uh, Ekdahl had some health problems, and he had retired from the Johnson Company in 1943, but at the end of the war he was still, you know, he was good friends with Johnson, he was involved with what was going on, he was, you know, he was still around. Well, Dardic, uh, sympathizing obviously with the Israeli cause for setting up a new Jewish homeland, uh, or a new Jewish nation state, it appears, we don't have proof, but it's more than likely that it was Dardic who set up a meeting between Haim Slavin and Karl Ekdahl. And they met in a New York hotel room with a Johnson 1944 pattern machine gun, and Slavin conveyed an offer of $17,000 to purchase a complete technical data package for the Johnson light machine gun. And the plan was to, well ultimately the plan was to build a complete production line in North America, build a couple prototype rifles to make sure that all the tooling worked, and then pack the whole thing up, ship it to Israel, and set up the production in Israel for use by the, the up-and-coming Israeli state. It's unclear exactly how, how much involvement there was at this point officially from the Johnson Company. We don't really know if Johnson himself knew about the deal at this point, if he approved it, if he actually facilitated it directly in any way. We just don't know. What we do know is that the, the deal went through. Um, it's interesting, Ekdal himself clearly also had sympathies for the Jewish cause, which is understandable with the Holocaust coming to light right around this period, um, because Ekdal had actually other offers for licensing the, the Johnson machine guns. He was apparently offered something like a quarter million dollars by the Egyptian uh, military of all people. The Egyptians of course didn't end up getting the Johnson, Ekdal decided to sell it to the Israelis instead. Um, again, Johnson was probably involved, at least tangentially in this, with the, the licensing deals that were going down, but um, anyway, the Israelis would go ahead and license some stuff out of Sweden instead, like the Jungmann. Anyway, uh, so the deal ends up happening. Uh, Slavin gets his technical data package, and what they end up doing is going up to Toronto, across the border from New York, to build, you know, to fabricate all of the production jigs and tooling and machinery to build these guns. And they do it for the most stereotypical of reasons. Slavin was in fact tremendously frugal, and it was the labor was cheaper up in Toronto than in New York to do this work. So, you know, okay, we're gonna ignore the dangers of the, you know, crossing international lines doing all this stuff because it's a little bit cheaper. Um, they did in fact contract with a manufacturing company, a, a machining company, they got their tooling set up, they built six prototype guns, and then for somewhat inexplicable reasons decided to bring the guns back to New York to test fire them to make sure everything worked. There was a bit of a hiccup when one of the guys transporting one of the guns across the border did a really poor job of concealing it in his car and was actually caught at customs crossing the border by the Canadian, I suppose it would be the RCMP. Uh, he was thrown in jail pending charges. The Canadian police started investigating why a bunch of machine guns had been seized at the border. Nobody knew what these guns were. There's reference to them being Bren guns um, in some of the newspaper articles. They weren't. They were basically early pattern Johnson um, drawers. Uh, the Canadians found the manufacturing facility. They raided it. They, uh, they took away all of the parts and the plans. And the story just sounds crazier and crazier, but it is in fact true. Uh, elements of the Jewish community actually reached out quietly but directly to J. Edgar Hoover, of all people, explained the purpose of the project, and Hoover was also sympathetic, and Hoover convinced the Canadian government to also be sympathetic to this project. Uh, they let the guy out of jail, they returned the parts and the plans, much to the complete surprise of the people involved, um, and the project ended up going forward. Eventually, um, sometime late 46, I think it was actually early 1947, uh, the, the firearm testing went acceptably, they went ahead and packed up all the production tooling, and they shipped it to Haifa. 
Now, before we go any further in the story, let's take a closer look at what this gun actually is, because it's not quite the same as a Johnson 1944. So mechanically, the drawer really is a Johnson light machine gun. But a lot of the details, things like the sights, the barrel configuration, the bipod configuration and such, are, are a bit different. And where the first pattern guns are particularly different is that they are chambered for 303 British. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have a magazine for this one. 303 drawer magazines are even rarer than the guns. The magazine was originally a sharply curved, it's almost a 90 degree curve of a magazine, uh, held 20 rounds, single stack, and functioned basically just like a, an American 30-06 Johnson mag. It's a, a very unique magazine, I'll include some pictures here. Um, like I said, very, very rare magazines. But uh, So you've got the magazine well attachment here. This is your magazine catch and release. This, since we're here I'll just point this out, this is actually the ejector um, and it is replaceable. That 303 caliber was chosen because uh, the Israelis had ready access or more ready access to British uh, small arms and equipment at this time. Um, the British of course used 303 and that's what the Israelis had access to. So that's what they chose to chamber this gun for. And certainly part of the challenge of designing this was adapting the Johnson to a taper, a relatively heavily tapered and rimmed cartridge instead of the nice easy straight wall 30-06. The first pattern guns have this cool Israeli crest um, on the front of the barrel jacket. Uh, on the top here, that is Dror, D-R-O-R, which is a difficult word to translate depending on the sources I find. It's either um, a bird, a sparrow or a swallow, or it means liberty or freedom. Hard, hard for me to say exactly what was intended there. Uh, but then we have a serial number down here and the Israeli crest. The rear sight is a somewhat complex arrangement here. Uh, you have to flip it up to actually use it. There is no folded down battle sight, but you've got an aperture right there and a micrometer adjustment for range. The front sight is this big, very distinctive shark fin style, identical to the Johnson uh, rifles and light machine guns. Interestingly, the front sight is completely non-adjustable. It's all fixed in place. The gun does have a quick change barrel system, but there is no way to actually zero different barrels uh, to the rear sight. So your point of impact is going to change whenever you change barrels, and there's nothing you can do about it. We have basically a fiberboard uh, perforated handguard here, and this is included so that you have something to grab onto when the barrel's hot uh, if you need to change it. This double tube buttstock is distinctive to the, the first pattern drawer. Um, it came off, came from Johnson's 1947 prototype. And then we have a bipod fixed to the front of the barrel jacket here. The bipod legs can lock down into one of two positions. There's a 45 angle, 45 degree position here and a 90 degree position. There is no movement to the bipod, so it doesn't pivot, doesn't swivel. It's just a solid fixed in place bipod. Mechanically, the drawer, like the Johnson, is a short recoil operated rotating bolt gun. So if you're going to manually cycle the charging handle, you lift it up like this. That unlocks the locking lugs. And then, oh, this one's, there we go. And then you can lock it back. This is our selector switch here. It is full auto in the back, safe in the upward position, and semi auto in the forward position. And what's interesting about this, not, it's not unique, but it's one of not a huge number of guns like it. The drawer, like the Johnson, fires from a closed bolt in semi-auto and from an open bolt in full auto. The idea is in full auto you want the open bolt for better cooling. In semi-auto you don't want to deal with uh, the, the movement of the bolt slamming forward after you pull the trigger but before the round fires. Uh, firing from a closed bolt is, as a practical matter, much more accurate in semi-auto. And so the Johnson and, and there are some other guns, uh, the FG42 does this as well. The Johnson operates this way. Now on the Johnson you have a gate here and you can actually reload it through five round stripper clips. There's a stripper clip guide built in here on the Johnson. The drawer in 303 has some of the same functionality sort of. I suspect you could reload this one round at a time with loose ammunition. 
you leave the magazine in the gun and you can top it up here. Um, but this doesn't appear to be set up to use 303 caliber stripper clips. I mentioned this was recoil operated, I should have pointed out that when you fire the barrel cycles back that far. And when I do that you can actually see the bolt handle rotating up and opening slightly. So when you fire the barrel is going to cycle back that far, that gives enough momentum to the bolt to cycle all the way back and operate. Now our barrel locking lever is right here, so to take the barrel out I have to depress this pin and then pull this lever down. This would normally be done with a cartridge tip, I'm just going to use a punch to do it. And this one's really stiff, so that goes down. There we go. Alright, with that loose I can now pull it the rest of the way down like that. There we go, and then I can pull the barrel out. The rest of the disassembly is really quite simple. We have a disassembly button back here that's just basically a big cross bolt. I push that over and then the lower and the upper simply slide apart. There's a pair of rails here that hold them together. There's that. I've got my recoil spring here which runs in the top tube of the buttstock. Here's our whole fire control group. This is hammer fired, so in semi-auto fire the hammer like so. And then it also has an auto trip back here for the full auto use. Removing the bolt handle is one of the trickiest bits. To do that you have to grab this center pin and pull it out while pushing the bolt handle forwards. That pin locks this assembly in place. So I'm going to use a pair of needle nose pliers here. So we go in there, grab it, pull it outward. And then, there we go. Once it moves a little bit then I can just slide this forward and now you can see that pin and the hole that it locks into. Incidentally it's also what is holding the extractor in place. And now I can pull the bolt and bolt carrier out the back. And then lastly I can pull off the magazine well assembly. It is held in place around a pin at the front, so to take it off I'm going to push this cover plate down and then the thing just slides off the back. You can see the pin, or the hook there, and it connects to that pin. Now if we take a look at the bolt and carrier assembly, first off I'm just going to lift off the extractor. Like I said it's held in place by the bolt handle, so put that aside. We then have a multi-lug rotating bolt with a very short amount of rotation. So uh, that's locked, that's unlocked. That's all the rotation that it needs. This may look familiar to you as the AR-15 style of bolt. And it in fact is. Uh, Eugene Stoner was well aware of and familiar with the Johnson and this was an inspiration for the bolt system that he used in the AR-15. And you can see looking at the back of the barrel that we have the locking lugs integral to the barrel extension. So when this is actually locking up it's going to go in like that and rotate. So in fact specifically what happens is these two lugs are traveling um, held in this orientation until the bolt gets to the very end of its cycle at the front of the receiver. Then the bolt head here is going to come to a stop inside the barrel extension. The rear end is going to keep moving forward and these two angled surfaces are going to interact right like that to force the, uh, the barrel, the bolt to lock into the barrel. When it cycles um, the whole thing comes back and these two pieces get cammed into parallel alignment which unlocks the bolt and allows it to come out the back of the, the barrel extension. A couple other features to show you here. First off I can pull off the bolt head there. We have a firing pin held in place by this little cam plate which this one's peened in place and doesn't want to come off so I'm going to leave it. Um, but that's your firing pin. Note that the firing pin is uh, not spring-loaded but uh, it's not long enough to protrude forward unless 
the bolt head is rotated backwards, which means the bolt head is locked, so it can't fire out a battery. We have a big open slot here in the bolt carrier, and that's where the hammer will come up through to fire. And then we actually have a spring buffer in the back end of the bolt carrier. I should point out here the top tube in the buttstock is for housing the recoil spring. The bottom tube actually has storage. You can see the butt plate is loose here. There is a spring-loaded button you can depress that allows you to pop open this. You can see that the butt plate hinges up. However, the button is not properly lined up with the access hole on this one, and this thing is way too tight for me to manage to rotate. So I can't show you the, uh, the storage there, but I think it's pretty obvious we have a storage tube and you can put a cleaning kit in it. There you go, there is the complete 303 first pattern drawer field stripped, just, sorry, missing magazine. Uh, we won't get into field trials for these because these guns didn't actually undergo field trials. These went into production, limited production, uh, before they did any serious testing on them. That's how excited the Israelis were about the potential of this gun. The plan, of course, the, the hopes, the, the big expectation for this gun is that this would be the first domestic production Israeli light machine gun. It would be a pivotal element in Israeli independence. All that completely fell apart because the guns didn't arrive in, the, the tooling didn't arrive in time for production to be set up and actually build any guns before the 1948 War of Independence. These guns didn't actually go into production until 1950. So uh, ultimately this had literally zero role in Israeli independence, despite all of the money and all of the effort and all of the time that had been put into it. Now about the time that these are going into production, and I should say there were about maybe 400 of these first pattern guns being made, they had been, uh, well the, the supply situation in Israel had changed by the time these went into production. Uh, 303 British was no longer really a readily available cartridge. Instead, uh, Czechoslovakia has become a significant source of munitions assistance or purchasing, and they have ready access to 8mm Mauser instead now. And so uh, military administration comes to the drawer production team and says, you guys have to redesign the gun because we need it to run 8mm now instead of 303. And that is where we will pick up this story with a video on the second pattern drawer in a little while. First pattern drawers like this one are exceptionally rare these days. As far as I know there are only a few of them surviving in a couple of museums uh, like the Belgian Military Museum here. So a huge thanks to them for giving me access uh, to this gun to be able to show to you. I think this is just a fascinatingly convoluted and, and interesting story to recount. So I hope uh, you guys enjoyed the video. If you're ever in Brussels, definitely take the time to come visit uh, the military museum here. They have a ton of really cool exhibits on World War I and World War II equipment. Vehicles, artillery, uniforms, small arms, the works. Um, anyway, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Stay tuned for the follow-up on the second pattern drawer, and thanks for watching.